network layer protocols, and IP addressing. Internet Protocol version 4 is the core protocol suite in the TCP IP protocol suite. It works at the network layer in the TCP IP protocol stack. And this layer corresponds to a network layer in the Open Systems Interconnection Reference Model. The network layer provides connectionless data transmission services. A network does not need to establish a connection before sending data packets. Each IP data packet is sent separately or individually. In this chapter, we describe the basic concepts of IP version 4 addresses, the concept of subnetting, network IP address planning, and basic IP address configurations. Upon completion of this chapter, you will be able to describe the main protocols that work at the network layer. You also be able to describe the concepts and classification of IP version 4 addresses and also special IP version 4 addresses. You'll be able to calculate IP networks and subnet. In other words, you'll know what a network address means and what a subnet mask means. For those of you who have been using these things and you imagine what they're meaning, uh, we shall get to what exactly they mean and why they have to exist alongside each other. And then we shall use IP network address planning methods to implement IP planning. Because of these objectives, I'm splitting this chapter into four sub five subsections. First of all, I'm going to give a general view of the network layer protocols. After a general overview of the network layer protocols, I'll go ahead and introduce IP version four addresses. What are these IP addresses? What do they look like? What do the different parts of these IP addresses contain? And how do we tell which address means what? Thirdly, I will jump into the concept of subnetting. And as you can imagine, it is subnetting. It is splitting a network into smaller networks. Because today we have enterprises that are small. Back then we had only big companies like IBM, like Dell, like HP, and so on. Today we have smaller companies that also want to leverage the, uh, the power of technology. And so we want to be able to build networks that are covering 20 users, that are covering 100 users. The default class C smallest size network is 255, 54 users network, which can be really big considering the fact that IP version 4 addresses are almost used up. We would like to have a way to break down this network into smaller networks so that many different networks can be formed instead of IP addresses being wasted. And that is where subnetting comes into play. We shall talk about subnetting today. And then we shall talk about the internet control message protocol. I've already mentioned that IP is a connectionless protocol. By connectionless, what we are trying to say is that when you are on host A and you want to speak to host B, as far as IP is concerned, when you run the command, for those of you who have done this, ping 9.9.9.9, .9 and maybe this is host B, host A will just send the packet. Host A will not try to establish whether host B is actually existing. That's why you ping and there is nothing that comes back to ping and uh, your computer just sends out packets. It just does the encapsulation we saw at the network reference model, and it will spell the packets. It's not going to try and establish that the packets are actually being sent out to someone or they are not being sent out to anyone. That is the challenge. And so we introduce ICMP to help us add connectionfulness, I should say. But really, ICMP is enabling us to have some error reporting capabilities. So again, for those of you who have done ping 9.9.9.9 .9 and you get messages such as uh, reply from uh, so and so and so and so, 32 bytes, so and so, this is ICMP speaking. It is not IP. IP does not have that capability. It is a design fault in, IT, uh, in IP. So we use ICMP to work together with IP so that we have a little bit more usable network than IP alone, since it's connectionless. IP works like UDP. After that, we shall talk about IPv4 address configuration and the basic applications. Any questions so far?
Anyone with any questions so far? Before I jump into the first part of this chapter. Okay, I'm assuming that silence means we are okay. Michael. <laughs> Is anyone online? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Online. Online. All right. So let us talk about network layer protocols first of all, and then we shall jump into the other things. Now you will notice that when you talk about network layer, you will find most engineers calling it the IP layer. Now IP is not the only thing that works at the network layer. There are several things that work at the network layer, as we shall see before you come to the end of this chapter. But IP is by far the most dominant protocol at the network layer, especially considering that we are today using the TCP IP protocol stack. The main things that work in this protocol stack are TCP IP for transport services, sorry, TCP for transport services, and IP for addressing services. So TCP is giving us transport from one end to the other, and IP is giving us addresses to the end we want to get to, logical addresses. So IP becomes the most and by far dominant protocol uh, in this TCP IP protocol stack at net layer. So it's commonly called the IP layer, but it is not the only protocol that works at the network layer. Network layer protocols include ICMP, as I've talked about already, and Internet Packet Exchange, IPX, in addition to IP. So we have ICMP, we have IPX, and we have IP. In fact, we also have IGMP, but I won't go into that right now. As I've said, IP is the dominant protocol in, in, uh, in TCP IP. And so I'll go right to IP and start talking about IP. And as you can imagine, it is the short for internet protocol. And it is the name of a protocol file that has small content. It defines and describes the format of an IP packet. That is what IP means. Now, in most cases, when someone says IP technology, IP routing, and so on, they are normally referring to content that is related to the internet protocol, this IP, but not IP itself. IP itself is a protocol file, which you can find defined in RFC, IETF RFCs. It is not... It is not the IP we normally refer to when we say, oh, IP technologies, or IP packet, or IP routing. When we talk about IP routing, IP technologies, we are referring to things that relate to IP, but not IP itself. So what exactly does IP give us? IP gives us logical addresses, things like 10.10.10.1 a way to find your computer in a big crowd, something that is like your telephone number, really. It is not exactly a way to locate you. It is a way to locate you logically on the MTN network, for example. You know, I can't use your telephone number to find you. I would need to map your telephone number to something, maybe an IMEI, maybe a serial number of your phone for me to locate you physically. And so in this field, we also have something else that we call the MAC address. We shall talk about this in another chapter for layer two uh, uh, network design. So it provides logical addresses for devices that work at the network layer, and it's responsible for addressing and forwarding of packets. They are three things I want you to know that IP does for us. First of all, all the network layer is responsible for addressing. Addressing is what IP does for us. IP also does the second function of the network layer, which is segmentation. Segmentation is to say that sometimes the packet that comes to us is too big compared to the maximum transmissible unit or the maximum size of packet that will go through our media. It is the job of IP to break that packet, to fragment that packet, to break it down into smaller fragments that can go through our media. The receiving host will do the reassembly in order to get back your original packet. <coughs> that is also provided by IP. The third thing that the network layer does, so the first few objectives are achieved by IP alone. The third 
item that the network layer does for us is routing, a way to find a path to where we want to go. It is true you want to go to 8.8.8.8, Google's public DNS server. But the laptop definitely doesn't know how to get there. So you configure your laptop with a default gateway, and that gateway is the uh, IP address of your router or your firewall at your campus, at your company, at your home, or whatever you're using. Now, when the traffic you're sending to 8.8.8.8 gets to the default gateway, the default gateway will use a number of technologies to make sure it sends that packet to the best possible next device that we shall see is called the next hop. The packet will travel in that way until it reaches Google. But hey, you're in Uganda. There are probably hundreds of devices that packet is going to go through. The number five, 10 dozens of autonomous systems sometimes, but it's doing that in about a second. The routers, as we shall see, are devices that have a special tool that helps them to calculate the best path to whichever destination you're headed to. That routing is going to be done by different protocols, not IP. IP is the protocol we are routing. It is the protocol attached to our packet. It's the one attached to our data, IP header. This is the packet. This is the data we are routing. We want to send to the destination. It is the data we want to send to the destination. So what happens is that we are going to use a protocol such as, uh, excuse me just a bit. Uh, excuse me, I was checking out this. Uh, someone, Michael Ainembabas, is asking in the chat, which type of IP does VOIP mean? So I've, I've said, let me, let me address that in a second. Uh, VOIP stands for voice over IP. There are a lot of things that we are taking over IP these days because of the power and versatility of IP. So voice over IP is a way we trunk voice traffic but inside IP traffic, in a way, enabling us to use the packet switched network to forward traffic that would otherwise be forwarded by the circuit switched network. Now, if those things do not make any sense to you right now, do not worry. But Michael, the IP that voice over IP supports is this IP. There is only one IP really. There was IP and there was CLNP. IP was originally designed for TCP IP and CLNP was originally designed for OSI. Uh, that is a bit beyond the scope of this particular class. But for purposes of your question, there is only one IP, the IP that was designed for the DOD, the Department of Defense, that we are using today for, for, for addressing, for routing and everything. So getting back to what I was saying before, IP provides the first objective of the network layer, which is addressing. IP provides the second objective of the a network layer, which is a fragmentation, the ability to break down our packets into smaller sizes that can go through our transmission media so that they can be reorganized or defragmented at the end into the original packet that we intended to send. So fragmentation is also going to be performed by IP. The third role of the network layer, which is routing, determining the best path. First of all, discovering a path. So sometimes there are several paths. Sometimes there are several paths to the destination. That path will take us to the destination. This path will also take us to the destination. This path will also take us to the destination. This is a router. First of all, this router needs to be able to discover these three paths. How does it discover those paths? You are going to see that. And secondly, it needs to be able to choose the best path. Using our eyes right now, we can imagine that this is the best path. But the router might think, oh no, this is the best path, depending on what it is considering. What is going to do that for that for us is not IP. IP knows nothing about path. All IP wants is to send data to where the user wants to send it. It doesn't even care whether the destination is alive, is listening or not. All it wants is to get the data off our host. This is our host, IP will send the data out. If this is another host, IP will send, IP does not care where that data will pass. 
It only sends it to 1.1.1.1. It doesn't. Everything else is none of its business. So because you want to be able to get some message like, oh, oh I was not able to find 1.1.1.1, we shall use something like ICMP, which we're going to discuss. And also, because we want to be able to find the best way to reach 1.1.1, we know he's there out somewhere, but you want some way to find the best possible path that will take the least possible time and has the least congestion levels. We are going to use a routing protocol to determine that. These protocols include things like OSPF. These protocols include things like ISIS. These protocols include things like RIP, RIP. These protocols include things like EIGRP. This is uh, Cisco's proprietary uh, routing protocol. These protocols include things like uh, OSPF, ISIS, RIP, EIGRP, and also BGP. All these are routing protocols. Now, in this class, we are going to talk about OSPF as a dynamic routing protocol, and we shall talk about static routing as a static routing protocol. But generally, that is what IP is able to do for us. There are two versions of IP. We have what we call IP version 4, IPv4, which we represent as um, uh, Is it like that? What does it look like? Uh, this is zero, one, two, three. Um, what does it look like? How do you write four? Anyone there? How do you write four in binary? We are coming to that in this class. Oh, Alfred. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. How do you write for in binary? Maybe I need to pass catch it. Okay, pass. John? How do you write for in binary? Eh? It is zero one zero zero. Zero one zero zero. Uh huh. Anyone has something different? Anyone who wants to be creative on this answer? Okay, someone else in the chat says uh, one zero zero. All right, so this is four in binary. And six, how do you write six in binary? How do you write six in binary? It is zero one one zero. Zero one one zero. Okay, so this is four, this is six. In the IP header, we shall have this code for all IPv4 packets. Uh, when we do a lab on this, we shall do packet captures and you'll see this for all IPv4 packets. We shall be able to see this in Wireshark. And for IPv6 packets, you'll always have this in the version field. So we have currently IP version four and IP version six. We have, uh, we, have, we have an RFC draft already on the IETF website that is suggesting the next version of IP to be IPv10. Uh, why they are suggesting 10 is because they are saying it's going to be four plus six that will be compatible with four and compatible with six, but this is by far uh, at the beginner level drafts and she has not gone to any stages of approval yet. Uh, but yes, it's a good, a good theory uh, that is carrying good logic. IP version four is the core protocol in the TCP IP protocol suit and it works at the network layer of the same suit. The layer corresponds to the network layer of the OSI suit as we talked about already when we are covering the network reference model. IPv6 is also sometimes called the IP next generation. If you see something like this, we are meaning the IPv6, which is the second generation. We call it uh, the second generation internet, second generation standard protocol of the network layer. It is designed by the IETF. It, was, it is very powerful, very versatile, and very secure compared with IP, but we are somehow stuck to IPv4 because we are used to it. 
But uh, yes, we are actually moving to IPv6. We have uh, coexistence technologies like, uh, like, like different kinds of stacks, six, six to four, IPv4, IPv6 of IPv4 and several others. After talking about the IP layer or the IP, the internet protocol as the protocol itself, I want us to look at the encapsulation that happens at the network layer. We talked about encapsulation in the previous chapter. Uh, network reference model. So the sending device will encapsulate the data that is generated by an application like HTTP. After encapsulating the data, it will request transport services from the transport layer. If it is HTTP protocol, of course, we shall have an HTTP header on the data. When it comes down to the transport layer, the entire data and its HTTP header will be considered as data at the transport layer and the transport layer will add its own header. I like calling it the layer four header. That header is going to be a TCP header or a UDP header, which we have already covered. After this, the transport layer will request addressing services of the network layer and therefore send the entire segment, we shall call our packet at that level, the segment, it will send it to the network layer. The network layer will consider the entire segment as the data, and then it will go ahead and add its own layer four, layer three header. The layer four segment together with the layer three header is what we call a packet. So when you hear IP packet, packet, IP packet, and so on, this is what we mean. This is going to happen on the sending host. We shall add an IP header. On the receiving end, the host that receives this packet will need to remove this IP header so that we, at the end of the day, receive our original data that the user intended to send. But what exactly is inside this IP header? What is made up? What is the IP header made up of? So let us look at the packet format. This is the user data that comes from the application. For example, HTTP data. This is the TCP header. HTTP uh, uh, builds on TCP for reliability. So this is the TCP header, layer four header. IP will happen at layer three. And so we want to break this down and see what exactly is there. We can see the version field, the header length field, the type of service field, the total length field. This, this field is sometimes called the differentiated services field. Uh, the identification field, the flags field, the fragment offset field, the time to leave field, TTL, protocol field, header checksum, source IP address and destination IP address, options and padding. Now options and padding are optional fields. Sometimes they are empty, but these other fields are very, very rarely empty. They have a number of bits that goes with each and every packet, which is actually one of the disadvantages of IPv4, but we shall talk about that when we come to IPv6. So what do we have in the version field? I've already talked about this. It is four bits in size, 0100 for IPv4, 0110 for IPv6. Now it is going to be one of these two things in this field. Since we are talking about IPv4, of course it's going to be 0100. The header length field is going to be the length of the IP header without the user data, that is important. The length of the IP header is going to be in there. Why do we need to have that length recorded if we know the IP header has a certain size? Now we know the maximum size and minimum size, but we don't know the definite size of IP header. The minimum size that we also call the fixed size is 20 bytes. And the optional size is 40 bytes. So if all options are used and there is some padding, we would have added 40 bytes to the fixed IP header, giving us a total of 60. This is the maximum size for an IP header. Sometimes there are no options at all. And so the size is just 20, meaning any IP header is going to be in the range of 20 to 60 bytes. Something, some value in this range is going to be in this field, in the header length. The type of service field is used for us to define different types of services so that we implement QoS quality of service based on the diff sub model, which is a little bit outside uh, scope of this class, but it is a way we classify different types of traffic in our network so that we can treat different traffic differently. 
In a bank, for example, you don't want to treat the traffic of, of the security of the security manager, the IT security manager, at the same level with the teller traffic. You don't want to do that. If there is a problem with the network and the teller can't reach the servers, the security manager's traffic needs to be able to reach the servers because there might be an incident. You want manager's traffic to be treated a certain way, not in the same way as the teller's traffic or client's traffic if you have wireless in your company. Now, in order to treat different traffic differently, our cables don't know the difference in this traffic. So we need to do things like marking, like remarking, like classifying this traffic into different kinds of types so that we can apply different treatment to different traffic called diff serve. We serve based on different qualities. The total length field is the length of the entire packet, the whole of this. The length of that is going to be stored in the total length field. And the total length field is 16 bits long. Identification field, flags, and fragment offset are used for our fragmentation purpose. I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, the time to leave field is used to prevent uh, loops, layer three loops, uh, our IP packet looping through our network forever. I'm going to talk about this mechanism in a moment. The protocol field is used for us to be able to know the next protocol at the network layer, uh, sorry, at the next layer that will handle our traffic. So let us say our packet went all the way to the destination machine and the destination machine starts decapsulating our packet all the way from the physical layer, takes it to the uh, uh, data link layer to decapsulate the layer two addresses and trailer, takes it to the IP layer, the IP layer decapsulates the IP header, removes it and remains with that segment. Now, IP needs to know who is it giving this segment to? Is it giving the segment to TCP? Is it giving the segment to UDP? Is it giving the segment to ICMP? Is it giving the segment to IGMP? This is going to be written somewhere inside IP header in the protocol field. So if the value of the protocol field is one, for example, then this segment is going to be worked on by ICMP. If the value of the protocol field is two, then it's going to be worked on by IGMP. If the value of the protocol field is six, then it's going to be worked on by TCP. If the value of the protocol field is 17, then it's going to be worked on by UDP, something like that. And there are, other, there are others, OSPF for 89 and several others, depending on what is happening in our network. The header checksum is a way we check the validity of our IP header. Yes, it was sent like this, but is it still valid? When you see checksum, it's really what we are doing. We have some kind of, uh, of, of sequence that we are using to check whether the data is valid or not. In this case, the data is the IP header itself. The source IP address is the IP address of the sending device, like 192.168.1.6. The destination IP address is the IP address of the destination device, like 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 for Google's public DNS servers. Options are optional fields, and padding is also an optional field. I have gone through all these independently, but I say this is used for fragmentation, and I would go through it alone. So let us talk about the data packet fragmentation. It is the process of dividing a package into multiple fragments. The sizes of IP packets for the network may be different. If the size of an IP packet exceeds the maximum size supported by the data link, the packet needs to be divided into several smaller fragments before being transmitted on the link. And this is going to be achieved using these three fields. But what exactly do they do? First of all is the identification. It is 16 bits in size, and it carries a value that is assigned by the sender. If sender device A is sending a packet, it's going to assign an identification as it does the fragmentation. It assigns an identification to each fragment. These IDs are going to be used by the receiving device to reassemble the fragment. The flags are three bits long, and we call them flags because they are flags. They are three bits like that, 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 or that, 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 or that, 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 that like that, like that, like that. Now, each of these bits has a particular name and a particular function. 
The first bit is the reserved fragment bit. It is always zero. It is reserved for future functions. So right now, it is just always zero. If you check that in data packets you capture using Wireshark, you'll find it is always zero. The second field right here in the middle is called the don't fragment field. The don't fragment field has a value one if this fragment is so small that we are not allowed to fragment it any further. And it is zero if we can continue fragmenting this fragment. So let us say this data has been fragmented into three fragments, one, two, and three. Now, maybe this one is so small that we are not allowed to fragment it any further. But this one is still big. We can fragment it if we have two at a certain point. This one will have the value one in the second flags field, the flags bit number two. It will have the value one to mean that you cannot fragment it any further. This one will have the value zero, meaning that you can fragment if you want to. I hope that makes sense. The third bit, that one right, right there is called the more fragment bit. If there is one in that bit, it indicates that there are more segments flowing or following this current fragment. And if it is zero, it means this is the last fragment in the list of fragments that we created, and there is no further fragmentation for that purpose. The fragment offset field is 12 bits in size, and it is used for fragment reassembly by the receiving host. The time to leave field, as I've mentioned, is used to prevent endless loops on our layer three network. But how does that happen? The time to leave field specifies the number of routers that a packet can pass through. Why is this so important? Let us, for this topology, Go ahead and say there is another router here three and another router four right there. And maybe for some errors in configuration, whoever did the network configured it in such a way that if this packet hits there, it will come there next, come there next, come there next, go there next, thereby creating an endless loop in our network. The way the IP header is designed is that there is a TTL field that will be reduced by one every time we traverse a router. Now with that design, it means even though we try to loop in this network, we cannot loop forever because every time we reach a router, our time to leave field will decrement by one, another router, it decrements by one, another router, it decrements by one, another router, it decrements by one, and it will ultimately become zero. When it becomes zero, any router that receives a packet with a TTL value equal to zero will simply discard that packet, thereby effectively preventing endless loops in our network. The next field I want to talk about is the protocol field, which I say it helps to identify a protocol that will continue to process the packet as it goes to upper layer, uh, to, to upper layer protocols. It identifies the protocol used by the data carried in the data packet so that the IP layer of the destination host sends the data to the process map to the protocol field. As I mentioned, if the value is one, it will be handled by ICMP. If it is six, it's going to be handled by TCP. If it's 17, it's going to be handled by UDP. And if it is two, it's going to be handled by IGMP. So that is the general overview of the network layer protocols. 